Basically, Mrs. Sakamoto was an old friend of my grandfather, and um, I think they had a lot of mutual respect, but I think Mrs. Sakamoto being a self-made man, for him it was very, very clear that I shouldn't take it ever for granted that we'd get anything from him. And I remember on one occasion, um, he took his fist, he banged it against the corner of the table, looking at me straight in the eyes, and he said, you will get these pieces, but first, I'll make sure you suffer. <laughs> Mr. Sakamoto Goro is one of the most extraordinary people I've ever met. He's a sort of diminutive man. He's always beautifully dressed in a fedora, a sort of bow tie and gloved and with a cane. And he's someone who started from nothing as a sort of dried fish seller in, in a market in Tokyo and has risen to become probably the greatest art dealer in Japan. We knew he'd put away some great objects over the years and we knew that there was quite a lot that we'd not seen and probably had been accumulated over decades. I spent quite a lot of time visiting him, um, probably four or five times a year. And I'd go there, we'd have a chat, he'd take me to go exercise, we'd walk up the mountain, we'd do sort of exercises together. We'd have this routine every time I visited him, but I'd never see any objects. There was one instance when he told me, okay, come to Tokyo, I'm going to show you all my treasures. So I arrived on a Friday evening, and so the next morning I show up at his door, and he's going, okay, first, why don't you move these boxes? So I spent the whole morning, it was really physical, because some of the pieces were quite heavy, so I spent three hours carrying boxes. We went for lunch, and he said, listen, I don't feel like looking at these objects, why don't you come back tomorrow? The next day, I'm getting ready, dressed up, and the phone call comes in and he goes, I'm really not feeling well, can you come back maybe next month? That was pretty much my routine, sort of getting my, you know, being stood up by Mrs. Sakamoto. And so eventually I got an audience with him and um, one day after lunch, he said, okay, why don't you go up um, to, this, to the first floor, which is a place I've never been to, and go to my tea room and when you're done, come back down. So I walked up and as you walk up the stairs, you see straight into the tea room and straight onto the focal point of any tea room, which is the tokonoma. And I saw this vase, a guan vase, uh, which is probably one of the most sought after wares of the Song Dynasty and sort of uh, has legendary status throughout the history of Chinese art. I knew already, seeing it there, the whole world w w was going to gasp at, at, at this vase. So I approached it very slowly with um, you know, utmost respect and uh, so I sat down in front of it and admired it for a while. It's a, it's a sort of mallet shaped vase, sort of greenish, bluish color, and so suffused with this gold colored sort of crackle, uh, running uh, erratically all over the surface. And for anyone who's touched a great uh, Guan vase, a Guan piece from the Song Dynasty will know the, the richness of the texture. It's something that is um, well known among connoisseurs and it's something extraordinarily sensual. So after about 45 minutes, I, I walked down and uh, he saw me and he was very proud. He's, uh, whenever he's proud of an object, he sort of holds his head like this and he said, you know, what do you think? And I told him, basically, I, I'll have it at any price. I gave him an estimate, which was at the time, higher than any object from that particular dynasty. Song ceramics um, are very understated, they're very simple words. And I think the beauty of them is that I think everyone can see something different in them. And to actually really, I think, discover an object like that has not been seen on the market for decades or even you know, centuries is, is, is a great, great privilege.